Good morning and welcome to day two of the College Lecturers Day. I am Fiona Geary and I work in knowledge transfer for Sierra of North East, um, sitting between research and um, our on farm um, knowledge exchange team. Um, so I hope those who joined yesterday found it interesting and welcome to those who are joining us for the first time today. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? The recordings for yesterday's webinars will be available soon on the HTV website and on YouTube. And um, so, just going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, everyone's microphones will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box on the right hand side of the screen. If you're having any technical issues, um, you can also use the chat and we can try and assist to you in there. Um, like the other webinars, sorry, uh, the next, this session will be recorded and it will be available on the website and on YouTube later on this week. We're aiming to finish at 11.30 and we'll be covering questions as we go. If we do run out of time, the questions will be covered um, as part of a Q&A, which will be emailed to you after the webinar. Um, this morning we'll be focused on integrated pest management. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, Paul Neves, the head of Crop Health and IPM, will give us an overview of the strategy. Um, and Joe Martin, Catherine Lamborn, and Charlotte Rowley will each be giving us research updates as well as all of the tools and services AHTV have available on pests and diseases. And this covers the three AHDB uh, sectors, AHDB cereals, north seeds, potatoes, and horticulture. I'll hand over to Paul to give us an overview of IPM and AHDB IPM strategy. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, if we could, uh, I, I don't currently see my first slide yet. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to, as, as and thanks for the introduction, Fiona, I'm, I'm going to give a brief overview of, of the sort of the work and the program that we're putting together at AHDB to, to increase our focus around integrated pest management. And the things I really want to cover is uh, talk a little bit about some definitions of IPM and some, some sort of new definitions that we're trying to develop or some, some new sort of frameworks that we're trying to develop at AHDB as part of our program. Talk a little bit about why we, we really do want this and need this new focus on IPM now. And then talk about some new areas of science that, that we think are going to be important for, for helping to develop new approaches and increased adoption of integrated pest management. And finally, just to say a little bit about the program that we're putting together. I will say that when I talk about integrated pest management, the pest there really refers to all of weeds, diseases and insect pests. So we're, so we're covering all of those things and you'll, you'll hear a bit more about what we do individually for those in the, in the following, uh, following presentations. So uh, next, next slide, please. So this first slide really just um, is, is to give an indication of the sort of pot the potential complexity that we're dealing with when we, when we begin to talk about integrated pest management. You'll see a number of, of, of schemes there which sort of try and summarise, you know, the, the various approaches which, which make up integrated pest management. Um, I don't want to really dwell on any, any of those individually, but I do just want to sort of look at the, the definition, if you like, just one definition of IPM from the, the Food and Agricultural Organization at the bottom there. And it's the, the careful consideration of all available pest control techniques and subsequent integration of appropriate measures, discourage the development of pest populations and keep pesticides and other interventions to levels that are economically justified and reduce or minimize risks to human health and the environment. IPM emphasizes the growth of a healthy crop with the least possible disruption to agroecosystems and encourages natural pest control mechanisms. So, I mean, I think that's a, that is a, in, in many ways a nice summary of, of what we're trying to achieve with IPM, but it's complex and it's, it's very hard for a farmer to sort of grab hold of that and make that a definition like that actionable and relatable. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the things we want to try and achieve going forward is actually make the sort of realization of IPM much, much more 
actionable and relatable to farmers. And I'll say a bit more about that as we go on. So, so next slide, please. So as I say, I said one, one of the things we just want to start out considering is, is why do we need this increased focus on integrated pest management now? Um, well, clearly, you know, it's important to say that, that chem chemistry and, and pesticides, plant protection products will remain an important part of integrated pest management. So we're not talking about, you know, we, we may need to reduce reliance on pesticides, but we're not, we're certainly not talking about replacing pesticides. But of course, obviously, the, the, there have been a, a lot of pest, a lot of plant protection products have been lost to regulation and increasing and are still being lost to regulation. We also have rising levels of evolved resistance to many pesticides in many of the major target pests, weeds and diseases that we're trying to control. And of course, there are associated environmental and consumer concerns about pesticide use. And all of this leads in some way to, to a slowing innovation pipeline. So the, there are less new pesticides being developed. Some of that because of regulatory reasons, other, other sort of more technical reasons because much of the low hanging fruit has already been picked. Um, and all, all of that is, is also at the, at the sort of other end, there's a number of policy drivers which are really putting an onus on growers and farmers to reduce their use and their reliance on pesticides. So if you like, there's, there's, less, there's less available less pesticides available for a number of reasons and a growing policy incentive on growers and farmers to reduce reliance on pesticides and that for us is why we really need to have this major focus on integrated pest management now and going forward so next slide please so i mean i i've I've only been in this job about a year with AHDB and, and before that I, I spent my time as a researcher at Rothamsted Research um, and I've been involved in a number of discussions over that time about the need for new approaches in crop protection, the need for greater adoption of IPM and the problems associated with the loss of pesticides. So I think that the, the need is widely recognised but I, th I still think we have to go some way towards developing new technologies and developing real, as I say, I'm going to keep using that term, sort of actionable strategies for IPM. And, and I guess that's that's really what we want to try and achieve with our new IPM program. So next slide, please. What was also interesting to me is, is, is sort of looking at, at what might be on, on the horizon in terms of thinking about what might be some of the new technologies, some of the new techniques which might become available to increase, to add new tools, if you like, to the toolbox or to increase our ability to do IPM. Um, so this this was just sort of five key areas that this was a, a horizon scan which was carried out by the National Academy of Sciences in in the US and they asked what would be the, the the major science breakthroughs that they could see in the next 10 years 10 to 12 years which would really lead to to, to changes in the way to, to, to huge sort of breakthroughs in in food and agricultural research. And they talked about systems approaches and by that what they really meant was they 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 were saying that you know, to tackle some of these complex um, environmental and agricultural problems that we see in the future, we really need to become better at integrating science and technology with human behavior, economics, and policy. So a much more sort of systemic approach to many of these things. They saw huge value in sort of new sensors and big data analytics, which will come in, which are increasingly coming into agriculture and, and, and helping um, decision, decision making, gene editing, and microbiome. And I, and I think all of those five areas really can be key advances for, for integrated pest management, for building new integrated pest management systems. Next slide, please. So I want to just sort of finish, finish up for the last five minutes or so by just, by just talking a little bit about what we hope to achieve with our new IPM program. So much much of the research and KE at, at AHDB going into the future will be organised under these sort of technical programmes. And we've, we have four of those, one of which will be IPM. So our IPM program, I mean, its overall goal in the centre there is, is to increase the adoption, the uptake of integrated pest management. And, and, and in doing so, to reduce the environmental impact of crop protection whilst maintaining productive crops. So we've got five on, on the outside of that, we've got sort of five work streams or pillars, as I've called them here, of, of activity. So the, the first, the one at the top is stocking the toolbox. That's very much about just, you know, continuing to do, to con continuing to invest the, uh, in, in applied research, applied and strategic research to ensure that farmers have access to tools and knowledge for, for, for 
um, a, whole, a whole range of tools in the IPM toolbox, not just chemistry, but thinking about biopesticides, uh, bio um, cultural control, mechanical control, and all, and all sorts of other new um, interventions. The, the second one, so going sort of uh, counterclockwise around this, putting the eye in IPM, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. This is very much about we're, we're keen to, to really de develop a, a, an, an IPM network and a data platform which really understands what's happening out on farms. We do much more coordinated monitoring of pest weeds and diseases and understand how farmers are responding to the presence of those, what tools they're using, and which of those tools are most effective in controlling those pest weeds out on the farm. We think it's really important because of all these, these various different definitions of IPM, we think it's really important to develop a, a standardized set of metrics by which we can measure IPM practice. So we'll be working with others to do that. Again, we have one here working with partners. We really think it's important to, to sort of speak with one voice around IPM, ensure that we're all using the same terminology. We all talk about IPM in the same way. And then finally, we've got a bubble there, which is around delivering best practice. And we hope to, or we're in the process of developing what we've called an IPM hub, which will be an online presence for all of our IPM research and knowledge, which will, which will make that easily available, actionable and relatable to farmers, growers and agronomists. Next slide, please. So as I say, you, you know, for us, we've, we've said that um, you know, IPM is is complex, and we and we think that might you know that's one of the reasons why we we see you know why there's why we need to continue to focus on increasing adoption of of IPM. Um, so for us, we're we're trying to. I showed that definition at the beginning from the the Food and Agriculture Organization, a long definition of IPM. We've we've tried to boil it down to what are the real key components of what we're trying to achieve with IPM. And for us, it's really just about thinking about a coordinated strategy to first of all think about what can I do on my farm, in my fields, in my glasshouses to to prevent outbreaks of pest weeds and diseases. And there's a whole range of tactics for that through sort of cultivar choice, rotation through design of rotations, hygiene and biosecurity. Then, you know, having done that, what tools are available for, de for detection? So we know there's a whole range of new sensors and diagnostics, remote sensing, that's really providing much more, making it much easier to know when pest invasions are happening and therefore to target control at the right time and in the right place. And then finally, we, we're always gonna still need control for, for uh, pest, weed and disease outbreaks and invasions. So again, and for us, chemistry remains important, but it really needs to be integrated with, all, with a range of other biological, genetic, ecological and agronomic approaches. So we're not overly reliant on, on chemistry for control. Next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, next, next slide. Yeah, so, so as I say, I'm, I'm gonna try and speed up a bit through these last two or three slides so I don't use too much time, but yeah, I've just used an example here from, from research I was involved in when I was at Rothamsted. This, this is, I, I, a lot of my research was focused on black grass. Um, the, this field, you can see a picture from 2014, was a field with a, with a huge black grass infestation. You can see it there. You might just about be able to see a crop in there somewhere as well. But if you go back, we, we went back and we monitored this field year on year. And we went back in 2018 and that black grass population had been almost completely cleared. We were doing this over about 70 farms, monitoring two to three fields per farm. And the idea here is, in, you know, instead of running replicated field experiments where you look at what might be the, the optimal management strategies for something like black grass, the idea we've got here is, is actually to understand what farmers are doing on the farm to, to set up networks where you can, where you can monitor in a, in a systematic way pest, weeds and diseases, but also monitor what farmers are doing in response to those outbreaks and what's working and what's not. And by doing that over a vast network, you can get great, a great deal of insight into, into what's actually working on the farm. And I think this is where the sort of the idea of big data comes in. It's going to be much easier in future to, to automatically monitor and to do surveillance for pest, weeds and diseases, but also to collect data on what farmers are doing in response to that and what's actually working on the farm. The next slide. Yeah, so I've, I'm going to speed through these. Just a couple of examples of, the, you know, this this is a project in in Australia, a twenty million dollar project, uh, you know, and I think we should we should have ambitions to do we 
you know we we can and should have ambitions to do similar things in in the uk so you know a big big project nationwide to, to monitor for pest weed diseases as they say to put actionable information into the hands of primary producers then the next slide this is another example from a similar a similar network or a similar cooperative in the us where they are basically um you know farmer farmers are sharing data and that, and this whole cooperative works on the basis of thinking about each each farmer's field as being an experiment and and if you can gather data from all of those experiments integrate it you can really then as the bottom line says identify which combination of practice really work best in given situations so again this is around this big data idea and the next slide please so yeah we, we also have a major focus you know we know that one of the major challenges is is in in um, changing people's behavior or increasing adoption of IPM. So just onto the next animation, this slide. Yeah, so, we, so as I said before, we know it's knowledge intensive, costly, timely, or time consuming, risky and site specific. So how do, how do we overcome those barriers and constraints and, and increase the adoption of IPM? And how do we do that working right across the supply chain with, with farmers, growers, agronomists, right, right through to sort of retailers and consumers? Okay, thanks. Next slide. And so this is just my final slide to sort of sum up where, where we're trying to go with our IPM program. We, uh, I've talked about this idea of, you know, simplifying the message, talking in terms of IPM being about prevention, detection and control, not just focusing on that control, but, but you know, building in the prevention and the new detection technologies, more, more emphasis on evidence-based IPM. So really gathering data off the farm to understand what's really working on, on, on the farm. Um, using this sort of concept of every crop as, as in some sense as an IPM experiment. We want IPM to become the, the new normal um, and you know ultimately we'd, we'd like HDB to be one of the go-to places for IPM knowledge and information. So, thank you. Finish there. Great, thank you very much Paul. That was a great introduction to IPM and the direction of movement for the industry. Um, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, they can pop them into the chat and we'll cover them as we go. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Joe Martin, who will be covering the weed element of the IPM programme at AHDB. So over to you, Joe. I think you're on mute currently, Joe. Sorry to jump in. There, give that a go now. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. Great. So yeah, so uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Martin, part of the Crop Health and IPM uh, team at AHDB. And um, I've been responsible sort of for weeds um, within the um, team for the past few years. Um, recently moved positions to look after pesticide regulation. Um, so looking after a lot of minor use um, and emu approvals within horticulture, but also an increasing need within potatoes and cereals and all seeds too. So in terms of weed management, what I've tried to do is give you a bit of a flavour of the work that we've undertaken at AHDB over the past um, couple of years um, across the different crop sectors to help address some of the issues of um, weed management that we're seeing. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll see that as we go through the slides. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we do um, at AHDB is we try and track um, active ingredients and their potential for loss, um, whether it based on whether they're going through renewal within the EU, um, whether or not there's a potential for endocrine disruptor, candidate for substitution, et cetera. And we flag these up, which really helps us in terms of um, looking at what potential problems that we might have coming around the corner. Um, and also to help us where to focus our research in terms of looking for either replacements or alternative technologies to um, help growers still achieve a, an, um, a level of um, weed pest or disease management. Next slide, please. So 
So within potatoes, um, they are have been experiencing loss of um, active ingredients. Um, so one um, particular key one was diquat, um, and also the loss of linuron as a residual um, control. Next slide, please. So across um, spot farms, we carried out a number of trials um, over the last, um, in 2019, where we were looking at um, residual herbicides. Um, and at that point, um, a clonifen was only just coming through um, for a registration in the UK and at potentially at a lower rate than the rest of Europe had. So we wanted to look at it across our spot farms just to see um, how it would work on its own and how it would work in combination with partner mixes. We also wanted to look at a replacement for diquat. So how um, carfentrazone ethyl or shark um, would work as a, um, an early post um, application to control those very small weeds when um, the potatoes were just coming through and to look at how much damage there would be potentially on those potatoes if the application timing was pushed quite late in terms of potato emergence. Next slide, please. So the contact site, so we had a number of trials um, there where they were um, small plot demonstrations. So our growers, levy payers were able to come out and have a look at those um, levels of damage um, a number of um, times. And in terms of the, the um, level of damage, what we did find was that going beyond the label recommendation really wasn't a good idea. Um, we did, um, label recommendation is uh, 10% and we pushed it sort of to 50% and we did find some issues in terms of yield and um, potato tuber distortion as well. In terms of the residual herbicide trial, when we looked at that, we found that the clonifen was, was quite effective but it really needed to be applied as a, as a partner mix. And we did quite a lot of work in there looking at costs um, to, um, to growers in terms of their choice of um, herbicide. And, and that um, could have quite a big impact in terms of um, profitability for growers and um, depending what mixes they were gonna use. Uh, next slide, please. Another area for potato growers um, with the loss of diquat is how are they going to desiccate um, their potatoes? Uh, diquat was um, probably one of the mainstream uses that growers had in terms of stopping their crops at the end of the season to enable um, harvest of the crops. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So these trials have been running for two years. Um, some work was also carried out this year. Um, and it was really thinking about life after diquat. So it was thinking about those products such as carfentrazone or pyroflufen um, and how, how growers could use those, the use of uh, pelagonic acid, and then also thinking about mechanic, mechanical um, methods in terms of trying to get that um, desiccant. So it was really thinking about those on, on an indeterminate varieties and also seed crops. In 2020, then we really wanted to think about that hard stop, hard to stop situations and, and how we could get some decent levels of desiccation on those really um, green um, growing potatoes. And part of that was thinking about um, reducing the inputs of nitrogen um, that um, maybe we, you could get that natural process of desiccation starting, which would assist in terms of those other products being applied. Next slide, please. The sites this year have been at um, all four um, spot sites, and you can see there um, some up in Scotland as well as um, in England as well. On a number of different varieties, um, fairly, um, so Maris Piper, one of the most um, common varieties that's grown. Um, and you can see that we also looked at um, reduction in the level of nitrogen applied compared to the standard um, RB, RB209 um, guide. Next slide, please. So that gives a bit of a flavor in terms of um, potatoes and some of the work that we've been doing there. Um, in terms of horticulture, horticulture um, for a long time has struggled in terms of having sufficient um, products um, for growers to maintain their pest, weeds and diseases. 
And the SEPTA Plus program, which you might have heard about, um, has now been running for uh, four years. And it was really about trying to plug some of those gaps. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see here, a quick infographic in terms of some of the, the numbers that we've been um, looking at. And we've looked at over um, 240 different products um, for a whole range of um, pest weeds and diseases. Um, in this year, there were 25 work packages planned and we did manage to um, get about just over half of those conducted. Um, and we've had some really good involvement from the different crop protection um, companies. And part of that is getting um, the minor use approvals, and we're up to over 15, and um, that was back into October 2019, and a number of applications um, are still ongoing. And there's a whole range there of both conventional products, but we're also more keen now to look at some of the biopesticides or bioprotectants, as we're starting to call those um, products and to seeing how we can fit those into some of the different growing practices um, that our growers and levy, pays, levy payers have. Next slide, please. So you can see here, this is some of the products that have come through that we identified as being good in terms of efficacy or crops and or crop safety um, within a number of different crops um, within horticulture and those um, minor use approvals that have come through. And as I say, in terms of bioprotectants, then there's at least 18 products that we've identified, um, which will be um, and could be useful for growers to, to take forward um, for the future. Next slide, please. So just a, as a, an example here, so we control in outdoor salads, um, particularly difficult um, are crops such as baby leaf. Um, so for these trials, we carried out some baby leaf trials, which were grower-led trials um, across the country. Um, and we also carried out some work on some whole head lettuce. One of the big issues that for the baby leaf crops that growers face is crop contamination. So uh, weeds such as ground saw, um, which if they um, aren't controlled um, sufficiently, then the whole um, crop can um, be refused due to um, uh, grounds all being, um, being poisonous. Next slide, please. So for these trials, we had a whole number of different um, treatments. And you can see, I've just put up the treatment list so you can see it there. We do code until we get um, approval um, by the manufacturers to uncode, because obviously um, it's not approved for use um, for some of these products at that point um, until the minor use approval comes through. But you can see that on, on this particular trial, we had three application timings um, to try and hit those flushes of weeds as they as they came through. Next slide, please. As part of the um, SEPTA Plus programme, um, knowledge exchange and demonstration has been a key part. Um, and obviously with COVID this year, that hasn't been possible. So what we are hoping to do um, starting um, early next year is there will be a series of webinars. Um, I think we've got six booked in for the different crop sectors. So feel free to um, link into those when they become available and they should really demonstrate some of the outputs that we've had for the um, programme and how they can be linking in to some of the future um, in terms of IPM as well. We're planning to um, carry on with this type of work uh, moving forward once this in this um, round of SEPTA Plus funding finishes. So again, look out for that when that comes through. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so weed resistance is a, a huge issue and Paul um, was showing that earlier with some of the black grass um, issues that our growers in um, cereals and orseeds um, have faced. Um, and this um, has led to a couple of projects that have been ongoing now within um, cereals and all seeds for um, glyphosate um, and, and looking at that. Um, and also some um, work being carried out on brome um, species too. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd sort of bring this one up in terms of glyphosate and, and product stewardship is, is becoming more and more important to try and maintain the armory that growers and um, have to 
ensure that the products that we are using and um, are maintained and are able to be used for as long as possible. So one of the, the products which was um, projects which was the um, reducing the risk of glyphosate resistant has come up with some um, some quite clear messages and you can see there in the in the yellow and blue boxes in terms of um, preventing survivors and um, making sure that the um, maximum efficacy is maintained by using the right dose at the right time, um, using alternatives um, where possible, so such as cultivations um, and other non-chemical practices, um, and then also monitoring, so that monitoring how well it has worked um, and ensure um, that we're um, getting tested um, survivors to check and work out where um, the sort of the dropping control might be happening. As you can see, there is a, um, a fact sheet, which I'm sure Fiona will be able to have pointed to when you look at the um, handout as well. So um, you can find out more information there. Next slide, please. So that's some of the work that has been ongoing and is still ongoing. Um, in terms of IPM and weed management, um, and this is something that we're focusing on um, for the future. Next slide, please. So as um, part of this work, we carried out a, um, a weed review um, and that is now published on our website. Um, and this looked at the whole um, cycle of weed. So you can see here the weed cycle, which um, is an, a slide that um, RSK ADAS um, kindly uh, um, allowed me to use. And it's about thinking about all areas um, across the um, growing system. So thinking about what you can do in terms of killing weed seedlings, um, all the way through to mature plants, stopping seed set, trying to prevent that seed return, um, reducing the um, level of weed seed within the seed bank as well. So it's, it's right across the rotation as well and not just that growing crop. And also thinking about on-farm hygiene, um, such as making sure things like um, combines, et cetera, are thoroughly cleaned. Um, that you're not transporting contaminated soil from one area to another, a whole range of different areas that need to be um, considered um, by growers um, as we move forward, um, especially as, as we lose more and more chemistry. Next slide, please. So within the team, we've been carrying out a bit of an exercise recently in terms of where we think um, our research should focus. Uh, and certainly for weed management, we haven't um, specifically gone right down to weed species level, but more about thinking about the overarching um, areas of work that um, need to be um, considered. So particularly areas such as understanding the um, biology and the impact that the integrated weed management might have on the biology of weeds. Um, there, there is some thought that there may be a bit more of a push for sort of spring germinators coming through now. Um, with, with change in management practices. We need to think about glyphosate. Um, glyphosate comes up for renewal in a couple of years um, and, and we don't know what the outcome of that will be, um, hopefully positive, but it's about thinking about those implications and mitigation measures that we might need. Continuing the work in terms of herbicide resistance and product stewardship um, it, it is clear um, and understanding why products are, not, are beginning to um, lose efficacy. And then moving forward very much thinking about precision um, in terms of weed mapping, understanding um, the, the technology um, that might be coming through to give growers um, again longer term use of some of the actives and clever use of the actives so that we're hitting the weeds um, in, a, in a particular way um, and, and not in some cases actually applying um, product to the crop. And then thinking about those non-chemical um, methods of control, so mechanical weeding, and that's something that's an area that we do um, sort of keep a watching brief off um, at the moment. And then we did, <coughs> excuse me, we did <coughs> have some specific area. We did, <coughs> excuse me, and we did think that um, Volunteer potato management was quite a clear, um, a nice area to think about because it doesn't just impact um, for potato growers, but it can impact on um, 
um, growing other crops that might follow um, that rotation. Next slide, please. So a little bit in terms of thinking about those tools for the future. I think, like I say, it's a bit of a watching brief at the moment. <clears throat> Precision application is going to be um, quite clear, but we do see a lot more um, in terms of um, robotics coming through. Um, there's a number of projects that we're aware about <clears throat> that um, are developing these um, areas. And also things such as electric weeding. Um, there's a number of companies um, now that are um, trialing this um, and are using this in, in different countries. Next slide, please. An area that we got involved in, um, and this precision area, was a project um, called iSpot. Um, this was funded um, by our field vegetable sector within horticulture. And this was looking at um, a robotic system um, and pre some precision application um, where there was camera technology to identify the weeds um, and the, uh, the application would um, apply a specific droplet. In this case, it was using glyphosate, but there was potential to use um, other products. Um, and it meant that there was a lot less runoff to the soil, we avoided residues in the crop, and significant reduction, as you can see here, in terms of the amount of herbicide um, put onto the crop compared to um, standard um, broadcast applications. Um, and we see this, and we see a number of products, uh, projects and products where this um, technology, we think, will, will move forward for the future. Next slide, please. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour for some of the weed work that we've been conducting um, and also our thoughts in where we think um, our research will focus um, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, a lot was covered there in such a small amount of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> bit of a whistle top, yeah. yeah whistle top tour. Um, we have got a lot more information available on the website and like Joe mentioned we have got a handout which you should find on the chat bar and um, you'll see it just above or below um, which you can download and that's got some direct links so that you can keep up to date with um, the projects and you can find supporting publications and documents there as well. So next we have Catherine who is going to cover AHDB's disease work in terms of IPM so thank you very much Catherine. You're on mute, I think, Catherine. Okay, that's better. I was struggling to unmute it. Um, hi there, um, my name is Catherine Lamborn. Um, like Joe, I'm a senior scientist in the um, crop protection and IPM team at AHDB. Um, and my remit is to um, look after um, diseases across the crop sector. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing within the programme. Um, and, um, and so, some examples uh, really to get into a bit more detail around some of the work um, or ideas that Paul's already suggested to you in some of his earlier slides. So there'll be a little bit of repetition, but hopefully a bit more detail to add to that. Next slide, please. So when we think about crop protection, um, generally uh, there's a, a sort of a, a, a layman's view, I suppose, of this is what crop protection looks like. Um, it, you know, it's worst case scenario uh, to, to sort of think of it in that, that sort of uh, situation and, it, and most farmers are, are not using uh, that, that type of technology now, but it, it's a picture that, that um, certainly sort of lay people or consumers I think often have in their mind. The next slide please. Um, so this is a little bit of repetition of Paul's slide and I won't go into the detail about it, but just to sort of reiterate that times are changing and there's a number of different uh, activities that are going on sort of um, uh, that are that have become drivers really for um, the change to an IPM um, practice uh, and um, uh, and sort of moving on uh, away from sort of those conventional thinking into a much broader more holistic approach to controlling uh, diseases in crops. Next slide please. So again you saw this slide from Paul 
Um, and I, I really what I want to do today over the next few slides is really just to get into some detail and, and examples of the type of activities that we might think around around those uh, prevent, detect, control um, uh, components of the IPM program. So in the program that Paul is leading within AHDB, uh, this sort of um, sort of main uh, components of this work fall under the the stock in the toolbox. Um, 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 work stream, which is um, one of the ones that Paul showed you in some of his later slides with that wheel um, in uh, with the, the bubbles around the outside of it. Uh, and I'm actually leading the, uh, the stock in the tool toolbox um, component of that work, which is really all of the research and knowledge exchange that we're already doing, but um, making it really sort of now focused around these, this sort of mantra uh, and making sure that we're providing growers with information and uh, examples and the tools and, and um, technologies to allow them to, to uh, uptake uh, some of those new IPM uh, methodologies. So next slide, please. So what I wanted to do was really just sort of break those down and, and think about this from a, a, the perspective of a grower uh, or a farmer, um, sort of thinking about IPM and, and, uh, and a new model for, for crop management really. So what we want them to do really is, is think about these in, in, in the order that they're, they're in, in terms of um, making some decisions around management for, um, for diseases. Uh, so on the prevent side, um, the type of questions that we'd expect growers to be asking themselves are, 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 as, a, as a sort of starting point is, are there varieties that I could grow that have got resistance to some of my main um, either pests or disease uh, problems that I see on my farm? Um, the next one is, do I know the quality and health of the seed or planting material that I'm planting? And this is really linked to sort of clean start growing. So we know that, for instance, that a lot of um, diseases are seed borne. Uh, so particularly things like um, bacterial pathogens can be uh, seed borne uh, and also uh, sort of um, some of the umycete organisms, etc., can often be seed borne. Um, but there are sort of EPO guidelines, etc., for seed quality and seed health that all producers of seed should be following. Uh, and so all growers and farmers should have an expectation of being able to grow a healthy, clean seed. Um, but often, unless you ask for the detail of that, or growers ask for the detail of that from their sweet seed provider, um, that there, there's a risk that they might not be getting quite the quality that they really want. And then also thinking about planting materials. So uh, in horticulture particularly, um, a lot of material can be um, grown uh, from cuttings, vegetative material, um, and that's those cuttings are taken from mother stock plants. Um, and it's not unusual, uh, in my experience, to find that uh, that mother stock can be um, quite heavily infested with um, different pathogens. And obviously, uh, in taking those, um, when those cuttings are being taken, uh, even the tools that are being used to take those cuttings, and then the material that are being taken. Um, from can also be um, uh, sort of carrying and spreading those pathogens as well. So it might well be that you're getting um, plant material um, that you're wanting to uh, grow on into what you hope is going to be healthy plants to sell on uh, already come with built in um, infections in them. And particularly if they're bacterial pathogens, uh, they can be uh, almost impossible to, uh, to get control of from systemic infections. So the next one is, uh, am I doing everything I can to improve my um, and maintain the health of my soil? Um, and this really sort of links back to a lot of work that HDB is doing around sort of the great, under a program called Great Soils. Um, and there's some really lovely work going on in a project um, which is um, being managed by one of my colleagues, Amanda Bennett, uh, which is the Soil Biology and Soil Health Project. And within that work, um, we're really getting down into the detail of, of what do we need to, to have healthy soils? What's, you know, how do we maintain them? Um, and really what we're thinking about there is what are the practices, the, the farm practices, the tillage and, and, and sort of plowing, et cetera, doing to the soils, the structure of our soils. We need to maintain good structure in those soils and, and not compact them because we want them to be aerated. We want them to have um, a good community of um, microbiota in those soils um, because they can act as um, competitors and even antagonists to some of the pathogens that we see in uh, the soil-borne pathogens that we see. But also things like uh, increasing uh, the um, number um, and diversity of invertebrate pests, for in instance, can also 
uh, really be beneficial in soils. Because if soil, if young plants um, get a good start in, and grow off well in good healthy soils, they're far more resilient to um, some of the other disease problems that, that they might encounter. And then lastly on there, um, have I given enough attention to hygiene and crop rotations? So crop rotations is not a new idea. Obviously all farmers, uh, nearly all farmers grow uh, their crops in rotations, although I've seen some fairly horrific examples of of almost monocultures going on, um, uh, particularly in the horticulture side of things. Um, but the idea of, of, of sort of obviously rotating um, uh, areas where you're growing your a, a particular crop uh, is to stop the buildup of, of soil-borne pathogens in this instance. Um, and what we really expect growers now, and we know from research that's been done and sort of examples of work we've seen, uh, is that we're really looking at between five and seven years of a rotation to, to build healthy, healthy rotations and, and try and avoid some of that buildup uh, in the crops. And then thinking about hygiene, um, it's often, I think, something that we think about in terms of, in, in horticulture particularly, we think about it in um, protected cropping situ situations where obviously we think about cleaning down crops between, uh, glass houses between crops, um, et cetera. But in actual fact, it spans right the way across all of the different production systems uh, in terms of um, sort of managing um, sort of waste, um, waste from plants. So things like um, potato dumps, et cetera, when um, there's sort of been uh, sort of potatoes that have come up in the, in the, um, um, during the, the sort of crop preparation for the next crop or they're left over from previous crops. And they can sometimes be just left at the side of a field, but obviously they're a, a huge um, pathogen storage uh, area in reality uh, for all types of pathogens. Um, even uh, sort of items, uh, ideas like um, sort of cleaning down tractors um, and uh, thinking about the equipment that we're using on them and even walking through um, some fields that are infected with things like white rot, for instance, for onions, can easily spread those pathogens uh, into other fields, the propagules for um, allowing those pathogens to develop in other fields. Um, other ideas are things like uh, sort of getting rid of puddles, for instance, in um, uh, horticultural settings. So if you uh, think about um, nursery stock production, uh, we know from um, previous work that's been done in things, projects like the Phyto Threats product, project, um, that um, puddles um, even on, on those areas can act as reservoirs for pathogens, particularly some of the root rotting pathogens. Um, and they can be spread around very easily just on footwear, uh, etc., around crop and, and infect other crops. So hygiene is a really important um, area. Next slide, please. Um, now this is a, looks a little bit of a messy slide, I know, um, but I just wanted to use this example. It's actually some work that I did years ago when I was um, uh, working as a plant pathologist. Um, and we were doing some trials uh, looking at this uh, microsprella, which is a fungal pathogen that affects cucumbers. Um, and it affects the stem bases and fruit predominantly. Uh, so in the production of uh, cucumbers, they grow three crops a year uh, consecutively. So they'll start off in about sort of January, February time and grow through probably till November um, with successive plantings. Um, and when we were doing the work, we were actually monitoring spore levels within glass houses to actually I, get some idea of when the key uh, high levels of, of infection risk might be occurring, uh, hoping to target um, uh, the um, applications uh, to control those pathogens um, uh, appropriately. But what we discovered was that when they, what growers were doing was when they were planting the new crop, uh, they often um, took the old plant off the, the rock wall block that the, the plants are grown on and left the, the base of it just sitting in the alleyway between the, the rows of plants. And those could often be sitting there for uh, at least two to three days and sometimes up to six or seven days. And so if we look quickly at the, the graph there, um, hopefully you can see there's a, a purple line um, zigzagging up and down sort of uh, in the, the top part of the graph. Um, and you can see that sort of about um, two thirds of the way along, there's an arrow pointing down showing you where the rock wall blocks were removed from the previous crop. Um, and that was a sort of, you can see from there that the, the spore numbers absolutely plummet uh, post the removal of those, um, those rock wall, um, the infected rock wall blocks. 
Um, and you can see that you know, that type of activity of leaving those around was in just increasing the infection risk as the season progressed. But because growers didn't really understand the biology of what was going on with that fungus, they had no idea that that was even a possibility that spores from those old plants could be moving on to their new plants that they hoped was going to be a nice healthy crop. But the single act of, of, um, of explaining that to them and getting them to actually remove plants um, completely from the glass house and then clean down the glass house before they planted new crop actually halved uh, the level of infection in their following crops and, and in future crops over the years. I still know lots of cucumbers that still um, maintain that this is, is much less of a problem from them for them once they've understood uh, what was actually going on. And it's a simple method for, for, for preventing that infection. Next slide, please. So moving on to detect, and again, some, some of those questions that, uh, that we hope a grower might ask themselves before they, um, uh, when they think about managing uh, diseases in their crops. So do I understand what the key risks are from the, that might occur in my crops? So often in particular areas um, under different environmental conditions, growers will see um, sort of key pathogens that will pop up uh, on a regular basis. So um, we see things like um, downy mildews and blights, et cetera, being much worse in uh, the western part of the UK because they have high rainfall levels and those pathogens particularly enjoy those sorts of um, nice cool damp conditions and that helps them to um, spread and infect more crops. So understanding what your key problems are at an early stage, it might help you work out how to um, manage them. Um, thinking about uh, monitoring crops for key diseases as well, uh, um, but also to understand risk. So as, as um, Paul mentioned before, there's lots of new technologies where we can think about uh, monitoring for airborne spores in, in crops. And we've, we've been doing a lot of work with that um, in, in different crops. And I'll, I'll show you a nice example of that that we do um, in the next slide. But uh, it's, it's a really sort of developing area, a lot of new technologies uh, and a lot of automation happening with that, which is really great now. But you do need to uh, understand the thresholds um, for those um, diseases that, that might um, be arriving in your crop. Um, because there's no point in if you've got very low levels of infection that aren't likely to be high enough to, um, to cause a problem in your crop or cause the disease to develop, uh, then you may not need to take action quite so quickly. Um, but it's really important to understand what they are and when you should be acting. Next slide, please. So this is um, a, a, um, a tool that's available on the HDB website um, and uh, it's around uh, monitoring um, and forecasting sclerotinia in oilseed crop, rape crops. So the risk alerts uh, for this um, pathogen uh, and this crop are provided between March and June each year, which coincides with when uh, oilseed ro uh, rape crops are um, in flower. Uh, and we update uh, these three times a week uh, for each site uh, for environmental conditions that favour the disease development. So what we're doing within this um, uh, tool is really monitoring airborne sclerotinia spores um, from a network of spore traps around the country um, and then uh, also um, looking at um, sort of when crops are flowering. So obviously a grower themselves will look at this, know whether their crop is flowering already uh, and then decide whether they need to take, in, um, take action. So we know that infection can only occur when there's spores that are uh, in, uh, present in the crop and when the crop is in flower. So if one of those isn't happening, then you're unlikely to get infection and you don't need to take action. But we know as well that um, sclerotinia, um, as I mentioned before, with some of the other pathogens, they like particular um, environmental conditions. Um, for sclerotinia, we need um, uh, temperatures above seven degrees centi uh, centigrade and the relative humidity to be above 80%. And that needs to be happening for 23 consecutive hours uh, for that to, to be a real risk. And this is again, but sort of back to that threshold, unless we've, we've reached those uh, environmental condition thresholds and your crop is in flower, then you're unlikely to have a risk um, episode within your crop. So you can see then the, um, the graph and, and the picture on the, the right hand side there, that um, we have low risk area, low risk periods, we have near miss risk periods where are shown as amber and then high risk periods. And what we'd really be expecting growers to be doing is, is putting a protectant spray on 
um, when they are um, uh, sort of just before they hit in a high risk period. So in using that sort of near, near miss area, if you can see from forecast weather data that um, the con um, condition, the environmental conditions are going to be uh, stay optimum for that pathogen to develop, then that is the time that you would be triggering that spray to, um, to protect your crop. Next slide, please. So now we get through to control. So um, this is the last one in, in, in that sort of mantra, but it's also the last one. Uh, hopefully that you should be thinking about in terms of managing crops. So again, just thinking about the questions that growers might be asking themselves. Um, so are there any cultural or control options that I can use to protect my crop before the problem gets out of control? So um, you know, there are a number of different uh, areas that, that um, and, um, ideas that growers can try, uh, and most of them will, will sort of be quite familiar with them, but there's, there's new things coming along all the time. If they do need to then sort of think about um, going to sort of a, a chemical control options, um, what active ingredients uh, or biological products can I use to control this problem? Um, and it's really important to sort of think about those quite carefully. Um, so in terms of, of sort of putting spray programs together, um, there, there's a, a sort of a lot of thought that needs to go into that because um, in, in terms of using biological uh, products or bioprotectants, as, as Joe mentioned, we're starting to call them now. Uh, we know that they have a different level of efficacy. And so, <coughs> excuse me, if, you, if, you, if growers are going to use them in their programs, they need to think about where to use them, um, where they can be most effective. So in horticultural crops, they're really useful towards the end of a, a, a spray program because they have um, very either very short or no harvest intervals on them either, um, and no MRL problems, et cetera. So, uh, they can be very useful just to sort of maintain control when uh, you haven't got a big problem towards the end of the cropping period. But if we're thinking about uh, actually using um, conventional chemistry, um, it's really important for growers and farmers to think about what they've used before um, uh, in that crop and, and does the product that they're thinking of now have a different mode of action. Um, and that's really all around thinking about sort of maintaining um, or, or avoiding um, uh, pesticide resistance development, but also in terms of, of sort of maintaining the stewardship around uh, products and um, uh, and the good and good efficacy in crops as well. Uh, and then also, I think the last thing that you should also be thinking about there is, is what's the impact of the choices I'm making on my whole IPM strategy. Um, so uh, you know, I think that that's it's a clear example on on the pesticide of, of with um, thinking about that because if you're doing a lot of um, development of, of sort of getting good diversity of, of, of beneficial insects within your crop. What you don't want to do is go in with a blanket pest, um, insecticide that would knock that back. So it's really important to think about what, what the work that you've already put in and not um, sort of, uh, ruin all your hard work. Next slide, please. So this is just some information I wanted to talk to you about really around um, sort of thinking about that, that sort of um, avoiding the, the development of um, insensitivity uh, to pesticides in crops. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just using an, an example of some um, work uh, in controlling uh, late blight in potatoes. So um, potato crops um, are treated pretty much every five to seven days, depending on the weather conditions uh, that are optimal for, for blight development. Um, and data shows that often uh, we're getting up to 10 applications going on in a crop. Um, and um, I just wanted to pull a bit of data together here. So there have been a lot of trials that have tested the effectiveness of fungicides to control late blight in potatoes. But we're also now able to, um, we've got the, the, the capability of determining uh, the different genotypes. Um, so within the blight populations, we'll have a range of, and a mix of genotypes in all populations. But watch which genotypes are actually present in there because actually when those genotypes are developing really rapidly and you're getting a, a really sort of quick turnover of, and increasing the, the, the number of different genotypes within your crop, what you can lead to is, is getting some of those uh, genotypes that show insensitivity to fungicides. So a recent example of that would have been 37A2, um, which a couple of years ago actually showed some insensitivity to fluazamam, which is one of the the sort of um, main staples of the of, of crop protection within um, for potato blight. And so the data shown in the table here just was looking at sort of what are the, the things that are driving or what could be driving 
some of that uh, development of, of new genotypes within crops. And so they did a, a, a sort of meta-analysis, this is some work by um, RSK ADAS, um, Faye Ritchie, um, looking at sort of um, different components and ideas, hypotheses to see what, what was actually driving it. So we can see that increasing the dose of the fungicide that you're using um, does increase the selection of different genotypes uh, fairly dramatically. Uh, also increasing the spray number has, a, a, again, a smaller impact. Um, but the important one here is adding that mixture partner. So thinking about actually using some of these products in tank mixes where you've got a different modes of action, because what you're avoiding there is that sort of selection of new races, uh, et cetera. And, and you can see that in 46 out of uh, 51 trials uh, data that they looked at, um, we could see that they were actually decreasing the selection of, um, of, the new, of new races being developed there. Um, and um, there was, a, a, again, a, a slight de decrease in the selection rate uh, by using alternating um, uh, sprays as well, uh, whereas adjusting the timing didn't really have any, uh, any effect at all. Um, so information like that can really help um, us and growers sort of build really robust programs uh, for, for maintaining uh, efficacy, but also maintain that longevity of the products that they're using. So, Clearly, if they um, have got sort of genotypes within their population that have developed resistance, it means that they're not really they're not available to them anymore, and they're, um, they're they've they've got a hole in the, the, their armory for for controlling them. Um, so, a really important work to understand that, and also sort of again get growers to to um, implement some of that thinking around the decisions that they're making. So, next slide, please. So just finally, I wanted to um, think about, sort of put a, a discussion point out, I suppose, are growers and farmers already doing an OPM? Well, we know, yes, lots of them are, um, but what we do see, and certainly across the different um, arable and then compared to horticulture, we see a lot of differences between that. Um, so different levels of uptake, but also different levels of complexity and, um, and, and sort of risk averseness, et cetera, to, to doing that. So in arable crops, um, there's been um, sort of historically a really um, always good availability of fungicides. The, the, the prime market for um, the ag chem companies in developing new products because they're, they're big areas, good sales, etc. So they've usually had good availability of, of um, fungicides and other pesticides uh, to them. There's not really been, I would say, in, in the um, arable sectors, much, many drivers for change until recently. Um, and that's because I think that um, growers, um, sorry, consumers don't actually think about, if they're thinking about pesticides and the risks to themselves, uh, they think particularly around, uh, I think, fruit and veg, because they're the crops that they're, they're sort of cooking and eating and they're thinking about what's been applied to these and how safe are these and are these having impacts on my, on my own health? Are these, could these have impacts on my own, on my own health? Whereas I don't think that, that many people would think about that in terms of um, potentially potatoes, but certainly on the cereal side, I don't think they'd be thinking about that if they picked up a bag of flour from the supermarket, for instance. And also, I think that arable farmers um, feel it's a risky area. Um, yield is a, a really important thing to them, um, and uh, um, they feel it's probably too risky a, an option to consider in, in high levels of complexity. Whereas in horticultural crops, we see always we've, we've had fewer products available. So as, as some of the work that Joe was talking about earlier on, where um, we have to get sort of off-label approvals, so some emus, um, where we just sort of get an off-label approval from the main label of, um, that's available for some of the arable crops. Um, we also have a, a range of different production systems uh, within horticulture, so everything from permanent field crops like um, uh, orchard crops, etc. Uh, asparagus, for instance, through to sort of the annual field crops, which is more in line with um, the arable sort of system, but then right the way through to sort of semi-protected and protected cropping. And what the benefit of that is, is that you, when you've got sort of different production systems like that, there are different options for thinking about management controls uh, within them. So for instance, within a glasshouse scenario, you'd be able to um, um, manipulate the environmental controls in there. You could also 
uh, impede the uh, um, ingress of, of pests and diseases in there by screening, etc. So there's a, there's a lot more control options that are available to them, um, and they are sort of more sophisticated, certainly within those protected cropping areas. Uh, I think there's also more drivers, as I mentioned, uh, sort of in, uh, conversely to the cereal side of things, again, because it's, it's sort of fruit and vegetables that people are um, picking up and, um, you know, sort of potentially uh, eating uh, uncooked. So, you know, a lot of fruit obviously is just sort of picked up and eaten as it is. Um, but certainly growers still see it as, as a very risky um, situation because obviously for them, if they uh, get a crop failure, which they can certainly do uh, if we think about things like the leafy salads with downy mildews and bremia, for instance, uh, you can get crop, total crop failure within two days. Your crop will be uh, just ready for the scrap heap and that, that's all there is to it. So, But they've still got to supply uh, their retailer and supply chain. Um, so they feel it's quite a risky business. So um, all the work that we're going to be doing within the IPM programme and um, will be really around trying to provide growers with all of the tools and um, the technologies uh, and also then increasing, uh, hoping to um, encourage them and increase the uptake of IPM uh, so that they can um, develop that more fully uh, and, um, and produce their crops in a much more resilient and um, holistic way. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I think that was my last slide. Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. And like Catherine highlighted, it's really important for us when we are designing research work that we think about the practicalities and the questions that farmers and growers will be asking themselves. Um, the Farm Excellence platform comprises farms across the country, um, with strategic farms particularly facilitating the link between research and practice. So I'd like to encourage you and your students to get involved with the Farm Excellence Farms. They bring together both AHDB research and wider research and demonstrate it in a real business, um, including things like cost benefit analysis, which adds another um, dimension to results. Um, and all the details can be found both on the handout and on the website. Um, so, yeah, I would encourage you to, to get involved there. Um, and this brings us to our final speaker, Charlotte, who will be covering the pest portion of IPM. So, over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Fiona. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte. I'm also on the uh, Crop Health and IPM team, and I look after uh, our work, some of our work on insect pests. So, next slide, please. Sorry, just to give you um, a bit of context for uh, the insect pests that we are concerned with, um, this is a list of the main sort of pest groupings that uh, affect our farmers and growers. Obviously, no surprise to see aphids and bugs on there, they affect a whole range of crops. Uh, but we're also talking about things like flies, um, botulinum drosophila, gall midges, um, moths and butterflies and their caterpillars, uh, threats, nematodes, uh, other saplings and insects that are captive. Um, I've missed off beetles, but they're also an obvious uh, pest group that I'll be talking about later. Um, and so, looking at that list, it's kind of obvious that we've got a whole range of different species involved. Um, they have different life history strategies. So, for example, some of them uh, might have a migratory period, some of them might have a, a soil stage, uh, some of the larvae might feed within the crop. Um, and they also have different mechanisms of damage. Uh, for example, aphids might be transmitting virus, um, so it will be feeding directly on the crop. I think one of these things are really important to think about when it comes to. Um, working on IPM research for insect pests and thinking about what strategies um, might be successful uh, in trying to combat uh, damage from these insects. And um, also to highlight that we've got a number of different cropping systems, as we've already mentioned today. We've got the, the wide and um, the broad acre crops, um, right down to the semi protected and protected crops. And so each of these situations, each of these cropping systems, has its own sort of challenges. Um, and opportunities when it comes um, to playing an IPM strategy for insect pests. Next slide, please. Going back to the uh, prevent, protect, control framework, uh, I'm just giving some examples of what that might look like for insect pests. And a lot of strategies will be quite similar to what I've already um, heard about in terms of the weeds and the diseases. Um, 
the preventive, obviously, the ideal scenario would be to prevent an infestation in the first place, but that might not always be possible. So it's about pressing pest populations um, and trying to prevent damage from occurring, for example, through the use of resistant varieties. Um, in terms of detect, it's obviously about insect monitoring and trapping, um, forecasting, and making use of thresholds and doing risk assessments based on um, other data collections, for example, weather forecasts. In terms of control, obviously, um, talk about uh, product choice, but also how and when that product is applied um, to be able to minimise um, the use and make it as most effective as possible. Um, thinking about any resistance, uh, effective resistance management um, that needs to be done, and also doing an evaluation of that control to make sure that it is successful. And actually, that evaluation step um, can apply to the, well, should ideally apply to the entire program at the end of the season um, to see if there are any adjustments that need, need to be made um, to each the season. Okay. So here I've just picked out um, a sample of some of the, the work that's um, available on our website, but some of the research that's been done in these different areas on different crop pests and systems. Um, and this is just to highlight that um, we'll have projects that are focused on a particular area of IPM, for example, um, in, in the prevent um, section. We might have projects that cover um, a couple of these or all three um, and some that work on an entire system approach, so looking at the entire um, IPM strategy. Um, next slide, please. So for this, I'm just going to go through some of the areas of our work um, and use the prevent control framework for this. So for prevent, um, I'll start with Talking about some of the research that's been done on a project that was um, recently wrapped up this year, which was IPM for cabbage stem flea beetle. This was a three year project that was led by ADAT. Uh, and if you have any interest in cabbage stem flea beetle, I can highly recommend that you check out the final report that's on our website because they covered a lot of ground in this project um, and there's a lot of really useful information there. Um, but I'm just going to be focusing on one, one aspect of that project today. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, idea behind uh, this aspect of the project was to look for alternative control solutions, um, but actually um, they came up with a, a preventative um, strategy. And this is using volunteer all these rope as a tap crop. So pest work um, that's been done has shown that tenip rape and uh, mustard could be used as um, tap crops, which sort of distract beetle from the main all three rape crop and reduce ground damage to the all three rape. Um, but again, this, these um, crop crops can take land out production and they can add another element of management. So we were wondering if um, all three rape, which grows up um, in nearby fields, if they could be used as an alternative um, to distract the flea beetle from the new all three rape crop. And this um, exploits uh, potential um, biological mechanism of flea beetle, whereby we think that once the flea beetle makes its migratory flight um, and lands in a crop, the wing muscles then deteriorate to provide energy for egg laying. So this means that it's no longer able to make any significant um, secondary flight. Next slide, please. Oh, could you scroll through? Um, so I just were looking at um, and they set up an experiment looking at two pairs of um, fields. And one of these fields was coming out of the drape and one of them was going into the drape. In one of the pairs, the volunteers were controlled early, so abnormal. And in the other pair, the volunteers were controlled late. So they were controlled once the new um, faulty drape crop had emerged. Then in the new crop, the um, yeah, salt beetles numbers and feeding damage was monitored. Next slide, please. So, as you can see from this site, um, the strategy worked into work well. The blue bars um, represent where the volunteers were removed early, and this is showing you the mean number of flea beetle in the new crop. As you can see, where the volunteers were removed early compared to where they were removed late, we're getting higher numbers of flea beetle in the new crop. And this suggests 
um, that where the, the volunteers are being left for some time, that um, some of the, the, the pressure is being reduced in the new crop. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's important to note that this didn't work in every situation, and uh, we did see that when there was a smaller area of volunteers left, um, the result was less clear. And this is possibly because there needs to be a, a decent area of volunteers available to produce um, the, the volatiles that might be attracting the food vehicle in the crop. Um, it might also be a case of different growth stages and the different attractiveness of those growth stages. So the volunteers um, might not be as attractive as the new crop um, at the time of migration. And that's something that we're going to be looking at in, in future work. Um, however, this is a nice example of an IPM strategy that doesn't really have any um, negative impacts. Um, it's a fairly uh, deep and easy strategy for farmers to adapt. Um, and it can, if it can lead to some reduced damage, and then that employed with, with other IPM strategies can really start to reduce um, that risk to the crop. Next slide, please. So, as I said, we're starting a new program of work this autumn, um, reducing the impact of flea beetle on all these rates. And this is another three year project led by ADAS. Um, in one part of this work, we're actually planning a whole range of different field trials with uh, a number of industry partners, uh, and a lot of these are focused on sort of preventative strategies, so things like companion crops, mulching, organic amendments that's growing, and it's all about trying to get the, the crop to grow away uh, from the adult damage and give it the best uh, start possible. Next slide, please. So for the detect element, I'm just going to highlight some of our uh, pest monitoring services. With acre monitoring, uh, we have aphid news, uh, which is mainly uh, a benefit to our cereal growers. And this is based on data that's collected by the Rotten Third Research Insect Survey. So this is essentially a network of suction traps that, um, as you can see on that map, um, they're distributed around the country, and they basically suck air out of the sky um, and collect um, aphids as they migrate into crops. Um, and so what the team at Rotten said do is they take this data and they, they take samples and they count the different um, aphid species um, and disseminate this by, our web, uh, by their website. And we um, put this into a bulletin for farmers um, in the form of this, uh, this table, as you can see. So this gives you the, um, the number of aphids that have been collected of a particular species in a week, and then compares that to the same cropping period for the previous year, and compares it to a 10-year mean. This gives farmers a heads up as to when aphids are moving into crops, and what the aphid pressure is looking like uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. And a similar uh, network that we have that's more targeted at uh, our potato growers is the yellow water tap network that's um, run by Sarah. And so these water traps are situated in potato growing areas and uh, potato agronomists um, send the samples off to Sarah on a weekly basis. The team at Sarah um, look at the, the contents, uh, they count the different species and they provide a virus pressure index. So, uh, virus pressure is really important to uh, potato growers, and some open species are best at transmitting potato viruses to others. So, by looking at the composition of species that are being um, collected in these traps, um, we can assign uh, a virus pressure index that gives an, an indication of virus risk for those particular crops. And next slide, please. Another area of pest monitoring that we do is in the form of pest bulletin, and this is mainly targeted at our horticultural sector. So this is run by uh, Warwick University and covers a range of different pest species, not just aphids, that are, um, that are a concern to uh, horticultural growers. And it provides monitoring information and forecast information for, for all of these um, species. Okay. 
Okay, so moving on to control, I'm just going to highlight um, one of our tools, which is the BYDV tool. The next slide, please. So, a bit of context behind this um, BYDV is a uh, barley yellow dwarf virus, which is transmitted to cereal crops in the autumn by cereal aphids. Now, previously, uh, crops were protected by neonicotinoid seed treatments. However, a couple of years ago, these were withdrawn. So now growers are relying on the use of polyfluid sprays to manage their, their aphid pressure. This tool is based um, on some work that suggests that a uh, second generation of aphids appears after uh, 170 degree days. Now, the secondary generation is the one um, that is responsible for spreading the virus throughout the crop. So the winged aphids migrate in, they'll transmit the virus to individual plants, and then it, as they reproduce, it's the secondary generation that then moves throughout the crop. So in terms of um, spray timings and making the most um, efficient use of sprays, it's better to target a secondary generation rather than the, the winged adults that might be migrating in uh, over several months. Essentially, this tool is tracking um, the development of that secondary generation by um, looking at the degree days um, in, in the field based on weather data that we uh, provide through our weather hub service. So, from looking at this tool as, um, and the local weather station, farmers can see that when um, the line is approaching that red line at the top, if they do need to spray, if there are aphids in the crop and the, the virus risk is high enough, then that is when they should be doing it for the best use of their BYDV. And next slide, please. So, some additional work that we're doing um, in another phase of BYDV research um, is the management of aphid and BYDV risk in winter cereals project, which started last year. So this is another three-year project led by ADAS, and what the team are doing, well, one, one aspect is to actually see if we can improve upon this BYDV tool and provide a more comprehensive decision support system. And this is based on some work that was done um, a couple of decades ago on um, actually trying to model A for development in the field and understand um, virus transmission in the field and um, be able to develop um, a tool to help farmers understand the risk of their crop based on aphid numbers and um, virus prevalence in those aphids. Uh, so that's a piece of work that's ongoing um, and that we hope to be able to um, develop into another usable tool. Next slide, please. So I've just given you um, a really brief snapshot of some of our work on insect pests, um, but if you do have, if you do want any more information about our insect pests, I can highly recommend the Pest Encyclopedia. This covers um, pests of um, cereals and field veg crops, and it gives a really nice overview of the different pest groups. It gives um, a lot of information about individual pest species, so why they're a problem, um, the life cycle identification, and um, non-chemical management strategies. Um, and it also has an effect on um, beneficial insects um, and natural enemies of um, certain insect pests. Also, recommend checking out our research reports on the website. And the HGB Knowledge Library also has some more detailed pest pages um, if you filter by crops and by pests. Uh, and obviously, if you have any questions or want any more information, then do feel free to drop me an email. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Again, a lot to cover in such a, a short amount of time. Um, pest monitoring and chemical control um, and non-chemical control is actually a theme across all of the strategic cereal farms this year. Um, they run from Scotland um, into the Midlands and then East Anglia. The links to their web pages will be available on the handout as well, as well as um, links to all of the tools services and publications that Charlotte has mentioned. This brings us to the end of the webinar. I'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers this morning and to everyone else who's worked to bring this webinar um, together. But, and I'd also like to say thank you to joining us, for joining us this morning. Um, 
I'd like to draw your attention to some useful resources which will be shown on the screen in a second. Um, the AHDB website contains all of the publications, tools, market information, um, as well as research updates. So that would be our first port, port of call for you. Um, there'll be direct links included on the handout as well, so hopefully it'll make it slightly easier to find. Um, next month, um, or by the start of December, we'll also um, produce the Arable Research Review, which um, covers all of the arable so cereals and seeds and potatoes research, which is happening at the moment. If you or your students have any questions, AHDB has got both um, topical experts and uh, field staff who would be happy to, to talk to you at any point, and all of their details are available on the website as well. Uh, just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the website as well as all of the other College Lecturers Day webinars. Um, that will be on the website and on YouTube later on this week. When the webinar closes, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey which helps us to ensure that the events are useful to you. We'd really appreciate you taking a few moments to fill that out. Um, and the final session will start at 2 p.m. this afternoon, which focuses on business and will close the College Lecturers Day webinar series. So thank you very much for joining us this morning and we hope to see you later in the final webinar.